You know, any time our children are involved in, in worship, it's always a great time, and we do involve them quite a bit, so, and uh, even when they're not down here, and they're up in their room doing worship upstairs, uh, they always let us know that they're up there. <laughs> they seem to do songs that where they stomp their feet and, uh, and the like, clap their hands, and they just have a, a great time worshiping there. You know, we sang this morning, Oh, Holy Night. Oh, holy night, the stars are brightly shining. It is the night of our dear Savior's birth. You know, we can only imagine that holy night and what it would have been like almost 2,000 years ago. And I don't know about you, but for me, the nativity has always held a fascination in my mind. I was actually able to travel to Bethlehem in 2011, about 10 years ago. And we visited the church of the nativity, the historical site of Jesus' birth. The church has been built over uh, the site. And uh, that's kind of a picture of what's inside the church down on the lower level. And many people kneel there, place their hand down in that hole there at that star. And there's a rock that you feel there. And again, it is said that that was where Jesus was born. Um, but it always seemed so very peaceful to me, the peaceful image of the nativity. And each one of us here today will receive a stamped out wooden manger scene ornament for your tree as you leave this morning. The manger scene, you've got Mary there, you've got Joseph, of course, you've got little baby Jesus, and the cows are lowing. Uh, whatever lowing is. Um, does anybody know what, what lowing is? Surely there's someone out there that knows. Um, you know, I don't know what it means, but the cows are there and they are lowing and there's an emotional draw to that whole scene. But I actually think that the nativity scene uh, does a great disservice to what the, that night would have really been like. Uh, because the reality is, is here's a teenage girl who is expecting child by someone who is not her fiance or her husband, uh, she's pregnant by the Holy Spirit. You know, that's a whole other thing that would have caused a lot of problems for them. But then she travels pregnant with Joseph to Bethlehem. She's nine months pregnant. And I want you to picture this. She's nine months pregnant and travels somewhere between 80 and 100 miles on the back of a donkey. And then they get to Bethlehem, and, there, and there's no place to stay. There's no inn. There is no hotel. Uh, there are no friends uh, there that they can stay with. And so they went into what most scholars believe was probably just kind of a, a, a rock uh, outcropping or, or a cave. Uh, it wasn't like the scene that you saw where they were in this nice, warm, stable and everything looks nice and perfect. It's certainly not bad to have a scene like that. I mean, we have one in our uh, front yard at home at this time of the year. Uh, but it was probably just a, a rock, an outcropping, where uh, they put animals for shelter. And, and so she's given birth in the worst possible environment that you can imagine. It's not sterile. Uh, she has been given no epidural. And... By the way, I remember my wife, Kay, uh, giving birth to our daughter, Nikki. Uh, Kay was in hard labor for about 13 hours. And I remember the pain that she was in before she got the epidural. I remember the pain that she was in after she got the epidural. Uh, I wasn't a lot of comfort to her. As a matter of fact, I remember at one time she kind of threw me out of the room, or at least told me to leave. And she's always going to be my hero, though, uh, for doing that. But then I imagine that taking place uh, is, is in all this chaos after a 100-mile donkey ride, being in a dirty cave somewhere, I mean, it was chaos. It, it certainly doesn't feel like that holy night that we sung about uh, earlier. And now in the song, O Holy Night, there is a phrase, and I really want us to focus in on this particular phrase. And here's my hope that from now on, when you hear that song, uh, whenever you sing it, that this phrase will just kind of jump out at you and uh, give that carol kind of a deeper meaning. 
Yeah, you, you'll see this on your outline if you happen to pick up an outline this morning. I pray that you did. But long lay the world in sin and error pining till he appeared and the soul felt its worth. But then here's the, the lines I want you to pay particular attention to. A thrill of hope the weary world rejoices for yonder breaks a new and glorious morn. There's the phrase. There's the phrase, a thrill of hope in a weary world rejoices. And then it continues, for yonder breaks a new and glorious morn. You know, if there are two words that accurately describe our world today, I think it's those two words, a weary world. There are so many people that I run into who are literally overwhelmed, who are exhausted, I mean, there's just so much anxiety in our world today. People who are struggling financially, having relationship problems, dealing with uh, sickness, having problems with their children, or, uh, and, and they're just ultimately stressed out. It seems like there are so many people fighting just to keep their head above water. And that's why I think so many people can relate to this small phrase from the middle of this carol, a weary world. A weary world. But what I love about this song is that it also says there's a thrill of hope. In other words, in the midst of all of this chaos of that holy night, in the midst of the discouragement of a weary world, there's a thrill of hope that maybe, just maybe, for those who put their faith in God, for those who for centuries hoped that the Messiah would come into the world, be born, and everything would be different. Everything would be better. And you know, hope is not just hoping something will, will happen. Uh, hope in the Greek implies that this is something that you anticipate. You know, you have the knowledge that it's going to happen. And so we just don't know when. But that just may be, uh, there's a thrill of hope that, that all of a sudden Jesus is born in a weary world rejoices. And I pray that that is for you today, that there, in any weary world, in your soul right now, that you would experience a thrill of hope. A thrill of hope inside your weary world, that you would find hope and you would rejoice. Why? Because even in the midst of uh, chaos, of your dark night, there is a new and glorious morning. And Callie sang this morning, the light of the world, the light of the world. And so during today's message, I don't want you to just think about that holy night, but I want you to think about the next morning when the sun comes up and, and the Savior has been born and we celebrate Christmas, the new and glorious morning. And everything is different because with Jesus, a baby changes everything. You know, Barbara sang our communion thought uh, this morning, a baby changes everything. Let's focus on the phrase uh, from that song. It, it's there on your outline, a new and glorious morning. A new and glorious morning. Now to do that, I want to take a, a, a look back just a few centuries. So if you would turn with me in your scriptures, and, and you know I love to hear the pages turn, so if you have your written word, please turn there in Lamentations. It's kind of, now thank you, Dad, for stirring in pages. He's making me think you're turning your pages, okay? But uh, Lamentations, back there with all of the uh, uh, prophets, if you will. Uh, but turn to Lamentations chapter uh, 3. And I'd like to focus on, on this phrase from this song, A New and Glorious Morn. And I want to take you back here to this Old Testament passage to about 586 B.C. before Jesus in the book of Lamentations. Please turn there, uh, if you will. And go to your index if you need to do that or use your phone app. Uh, what happens in 586 B.C. is that Jerusalem has fallen to their enemies. And, and they've fallen to the Babylonians and the Israelite people are devastated. I mean, they've been defeated by their enemies. They've been taken captive, uh, many of them, uh, ripped away from their homes, ripped away from their homeland, and taken to a foreign land. It is the darkest. So many of them are even slaughtered. It's the darkest of nights. The darkest of nights. And the prophet Jeremiah, 
he, he's lamenting here in our text. He's complaining, he's hurting uh, with everyone. But in chapter three, in the middle of this weary world, in the middle of the darkest of dark nights, Jeremiah moves to this moment of hope. Look with me, please, at Lamentations uh, chapter three, uh, verses uh, 19 through 20. And guess what? Um, I did not bring my um, glass. Who's, who's got this in their scripture this morning? Anybody got it there? Kendra, I'm going to ask you to come in and read it for me, would you please? I apologize. I left my glasses at home. I got three or four or five pairs of reading glasses, and just like my keys and everything else, I lose them all. So thank goodness for Kendra. I, I, yeah, and this is new to her. I mean, I didn't, yeah. you know, so surprise. And, and uh, Christmassy, look, looking very nice. Okay, so uh, Limitations chapter 3, verses 19 through uh, 26. Why don't we just read the whole passage? I remember my affliction and my wandering, the bitterness and the gall. I will remember them, and my soul is downcast within me. Yet this I call to mind, and therefore I have hope. Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed, for his compassions never fail. They are new every morning, great is your faithfulness. I say to myself, the Lord is my portion, therefore I will wait for him. The Lord is good to those whose hope is in him, to the one who seeks him. Kendra, thanks for having that up on your phone app. Thank you so much. And you can pick up your present at the end of... Uh... <laughs> it says, I will never forget this awful time as I grieve my loss. That's what Jeremiah said. He, he'd had this tremendous loss. I mean, remember, Jerusalem has fallen. His country is gone. The people he loves has been killed, taken into captivity. He's going through a tremendous loss. It's a dark night, and many of you are there now. Verse 21, in the middle of this dark night, he says, yet this I call to mind. This I call to mind. To mind. Well, what does he call to mind? Well, to hope when I remember this. He says, I'm going to hope. So that's what he's remembering. And with all the darkness, he's remembering the hope. There's something that he remembers that gives hope. And, and what does he remember? In verse 22, the faithful love of the Lord never ends. It says that right there in your passage, verse 22. The faithful of the Lord never ends. Uh, the love of the Lord never ends. His mercy never ceases. Great is his faithfulness, his mercies. They begin afresh each morning. His mercies begin afresh. They begin afresh. And that ties us back to the, our Christmas carol. Oh, holy night, a new and glorious morn. My friends, at the end of our difficulties, we face a new and glorious morning. Now, some of them may be longer than what we would desire, some of those difficulties that we go through. But even then, if we're seeking God, if we're seeking the Lord, he is to walk right there beside us. He's so faithful to do that. Great is his faithfulness and his mercies afresh each morning. You know, I, I say to myself, Jeremiah goes on to say in verse 24, the Lord is my, anybody see it there? The Lord is my portion. Therefore, I will wait for him. You see, the Lord is good to those whose hope is in him, to those who search for him. So it is good to wait quietly for the salvation that comes from our Lord. You know, right now, some of you are in the middle of a very dark night. You, you feel beaten down right now by this weary world. And so today, I want to show you how Jesus can bring you hope and I want to bring that right out of our passage here in Lamentations. Even when it feels like your world is covered in darkness. You know, I want you to look at your outline, if you will. And I want to share with you four steps that you can take, even when things seem dark and hopeless, so that you can experience a new day of hope with Jesus Christ. So here's the very first step, and you can fill in the blank if you have an outline. Remember God's faithful love. If you want to experience a day of hope with Jesus, remember God's faithful love. 
You see, even when you're stuck in the darkness of night, in a weary world, when uh, what's going on, it, it makes you just feel helpless. It can feel like there's no way out. In fact, I bet there are several of you here today who are feeling just like that. I'm trapped, and, and there's just no way out. Well, that is why remembering God's love is so powerful. It brings you hope. It reminds you that there's always a way out, that this isn't the end, because morning is coming. Morning is coming. There is hope. And so if you look back and look into Lamentations, verse 21, uh, verse 3, chapter, um, I'm sorry, chapter 3, verse 21, uh, coming from our passage, it says, yet I still dare to hope. Well, hope for what? Remember, he says, and I love this, and so what does he remember that gives him hope? He remembers, Jeremiah remembers, that God loves him. That God loves him. You know, God loves each and every one of us here today. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. God provides for us each and every day. He, he provides the very air that we breathe. He's the creator of this vast universe in which we live. And if it wasn't for almighty God, uh, we wouldn't be here uh, today. We just would not be here today. And so Jeremiah is remembering God's love. He's remembering God's faithfulness. Uh, and he will always be there. And he knows that God cares about him. And he remembers God always does what God says he's going to do. You know, I never forget that. And because I remember this, I will have hope when no one else does, from the words of Jeremiah. I'm going to have hope, even it's completely dark, because I know that morning is coming, and I remember with God, it always does. Morning always comes. And that's the first step for some of you who are here today, is to remember the faithful love of Almighty God. Uh, it just never ends. And yes, Satan wants us to believe different, that, that night will never end. That night will never end. But you can push that aside because with God, you can know that darkness never lasts. It never wins. With God, the morning will always come. And some of you, again, are in the dark right now, at night right now. And it brings you hope knowing uh, that morning is on the horizon. You're in the middle of a weary world. You have lost something or you lost someone who is important to you. Maybe right now it feels like your world is just falling apart and you don't know what to do. The first thing you need to do is stop and, and remember. Stop and remember. And you know, I know that there are a lot of people in dark places right now. You know, over the last four months or so, I've been doing an, a, a funeral, a, an average of two a week. Two a week. And you know, it's not all COVID. Some passed because of COVID. Uh, some passed uh, just because, you know what? The baby boomers are just getting older. <laughs> you know, we're in our early 70s or, or mid 60s and we see a lot more of those in, in, the, in the paper. Uh, but you know, it's a fact of life, but it's okay. It's okay if we have a relationship with Jesus Christ our Lord, because we know where we're going. When, when we leave this earth. You know, I remember that God loves me. I remember how he sees through my tough time and he's going to do it again, just as he always has in the past. No matter how dark it is, you must remember with Jesus, there is always coming a new morning. Did I mention I had a, a funeral service? I can't even remember now whether it was Friday or Saturday, but I had it. And uh, I, ha I had one, uh, I've got one this afternoon. As soon as I leave church here, I'm going to a funeral service. I mean, that's just, you know, there's a lot of people that are living in darkness right now. But again, there's hope. There's hope. And I'm going to remember that even when I'm grieving. I can have hope in the middle of darkness because I remember who God is and I remember what he has done. That gives me hope. And so I don't give up. Now, to experience a new day of hope, number one, we remember his faithful love. Number two, I trust God to provide exactly what I need. I trust God to provide exactly what I need. And notice I didn't say exactly what I want because you and I both know that you, what you want is not always what you need. I mean, they can be very different things. You know, I read a, a, a plaque at Hobby Lobby last week that said, I'm not needy, I'm just wanty. <laughs> I know a few wanty people, you know? And so sometimes even though it's not exactly what you want, 
You have to trust as you're going through the dark time and, and that God is providing you with exactly what you need, exactly what you need. Now, back to our passage in Lamentations, verse 24. It says this, it's Jeremiah. He says, I say to myself, isn't that interesting? He said, I say to myself, sometimes, you know, I heard a comment the other day, once again, I don't know, this must have been a b b meme on Facebook or something. It, it says, you know, sometimes I talk to myself, and, and then we just kind of sit back and laugh and laugh. <laughs> I think it's great, only because I can relate. <laughs> but, um, so he says, you know, I talk to myself. I talk to myself, and you know, it does us good uh, from time to time uh, to do uh, just that, to have a conversation uh, with ourself and grow from that experience, grow from that experience. Um, and so I'm feeling really dark, but I'm looking at myself in the mirror and I'm telling this to myself. We see there in verse 24, so he says, I say to myself, the Lord is my portion. He's my portion. Therefore, I will wait for him. What does it mean that God is my portion? Well, this most likely refers to back in the Old Testament. You know what I'm talking about. When the Israelites were wandering around in the desert, and every day God would provide food for them. God gave them manna to eat. And it was a food that, that provided mysteriously every morning something for them uh, to eat. Every morning. God gave them just enough manna for that day so that they would have enough to eat. Now, they couldn't collect it and build it up and hoard it because it would just rot right away. It would rot right away. If they ever tried to sort, if they ever tried to hoard the manna, it would just rot. And so they always had enough for that day, but no more. I believe God was trying to teach them, he tries to teach us today, that they needed him today and every day. We need to look to him today and every day uh, for our provisions. Whether we realize it or not, we need him. We need him. And so Jeremiah says here in our text, I call this to mind. I say it to myself out loud. He says, God is my daily portion. He's saying, God, you are exactly, even in the middle of this dark night, you're exactly what I need today. And my friends, that is good news. God is not only here today, God is already in your tomorrows. There is nothing that happens in this world that does not first pass through the hands of God. Now, we've got questions. We've got lots of them. But what we need to do is put our faith and our trust and our hope in, in Almighty God. We don't know all the answers. We don't always think like him. We always try to be like him. But we always don't, you know, God is already in tomorrow and he's going to have the strength that you need uh, because his strength is perfect in your weakness. So if you feel like you've lost your way, God is already in your tomorrow. He has a plan and a path. If you're down or depressed, God is already in your tomorrow and he knows your joy. He's your strength, uh, his presence, his power, his plan, his perseverance, his goodness. And so to experience a new day of hope with Jesus First, remember God's faithful love. Trust that what God's going to give you exactly what you need for today. And now, the third step on your outline, if you're following along, depend on God for the hope to keep going. Depend on God for the hope to keep going, regardless. Uh, this is a thrill of hope that we sing about in O Holy Night. The thrill of hope in the midst of a weary world. The thrill of hope uh, when all we can see is darkness. Now, if you look back to chapter 3, verse 25, God's word says that the Lord is good to those who what? Verse 25, verse 25 of our text. God's word says the Lord is good to those who hope is in him and to those who search him to those who search him, to those who seek him. You see, as human beings, we can live for close to 40 days without food. We can survive for close to eight days without water. We can even live for close to four minutes without oxygen. But you know what? There's one thing we cannot live one second without. And what I'm saying, you see, there's some of you here today who in your life, 
but you're not really living because in some way you've given up hope. You've given up hope. You just think you're living. You think you're living, but you're not. Somewhere along the way, something happened to you, and, and you lost your hope. And so I believe that there are too many of you here today trying to survive without hope, struggling to find something that you can put in place of hope. And, you know, some uh, search for in all the wrong places. Uh, some people will put their hope in the stock market, but that's a really risky thing to do. Some people put their hope in their job, uh, but if you do that, you may get let down. You may put your hope in another person, but I'll tell you, a person will always let you down. You, you see, when we put our hope in the wrong people or the wrong things, we end up every time hopeless. We end up hopeless, and we become weary. We begin to wonder if there's anything good, but... There's a memory verse on your outline, if you picked one up. If not, at least jot down the text. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 23. Hebrews chapter 10, 23. Look it up later. Let us hold tightly without wavering to the hope we affirm, for God can be trusted to keep his promise. Everything he promises in the scripture is true. It's true. You know, I love this picture. He says, let's hold tightly to the hope that can be trusted. He's saying, grab hold of the hope that we have in Jesus and don't ever, don't ever let go. Now, the challenge is we often let go of hope. We have Jesus and we grab onto fear. We grab onto anxiety. We grab onto this weary world and then we go down with it. And we, we just let go of God's truth. And we hold on to the truth, to the lies of the evil one. And that this night we're in is going to last forever. That's what Satan wants us to believe. That's what he wants for us to believe. You know what? I lost my 19-year-old grandson in a tragic accident several years ago. Got hit by a car. My brother and my sister all died of cancer before the age of 60, shortly after that. Um, all the while, I was battling, battling with hepatitis C, which, praise God, the doctors cured after about 20 years. At phase four, cirrhosis of the liver. My liver is probably still doing some crazy things at time. My mother died of cancer not long after that. My, my other sister beat lung cancer with several rounds of chemo just a couple of years ago. You know, times were dark at that time for me. But you know what? I believed with all my heart that Jesus is the light of the world. And that's what helped me to get through those things. Remember, there's a big difference between Christmas music and Christmas carols. Christmas music, that's the song we sing to celebrate the holiday. We sing about Santa and his reindeer and presents and decorations and all that. And all those are great and fun things. They really are. Uh, those are good. Sometimes they bring back warm memories. There's nothing wrong with those. But the original music of Christmas, the music that we call Christmas carols, they were written for more than just nostalgic or traditional reasons. They were written to help tell the world the most important story that's ever been told, just like O Holy Night that we're talking about this morning. I'm not kidding. I can't, you know, today we have looked at O Holy Night. This is one of my favorites. I learned it when I was in about sixth grade singing in a choir. Uh, in one of the few schools I was ever long, long enough there to sing in anything. But it's one of my favorites because, you know, I can really, have you noticed the high notes in Whole Holy Night? It's one of my favorites because I can really hit those high notes. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I, I can't do that a bit. Um, I act like it sometimes, but you're, you're probably familiar, though, with this carol, but you may not know its history, and I'm just going to cut this short. I'm going to say to you that the gentleman that wrote this song, uh, it was written in a poem form, uh, and he was asked uh, by a, a professor in the school to, to write him a poem. And so he wrote, O oh, Holy Night, and it was written in the mid-1800s. He liked it so well, that poem, that he went to a friend, and he asked a friend to put it to music. And, and so his friend did that. And uh, the priest asked him if he, he after writing the poem, um, you know, if he'd let us use, use the music and sing the song. 
he liked the poem so much. And so, O Holy Night was composed and it was written and taken back to the church. And guess what? The church loved the song. I mean, it spread so rapidly. Here's what I didn't tell you. Uh, the gentleman that wrote the poem, he was asked to write about the Christmas story. So he did that, uh, but he wasn't a Christian. Guess what? The man that he went to to, to put the uh, music to this song wasn't a Christian either. And so the people loved the song. The people in the church, Christians, they loved the song. And, and so they tried to get rid of the song, though, when they heard about these guys weren't, weren't even Christians. And it, they couldn't stop it. I mean, it spread like wildfire. Fire. And I realized I would never be coming home again. Um, when, uh, you know, people, you're, you're, things change in your surroundings. And what used to be your home is not necessarily your home anymore, so you make a home elsewhere, you know, with your family and so on. But God might be, just be saying to you right now, yeah, you're in the middle of the night uh, now, but morning is coming. That's what I want you to hear. With Jesus in your life, the morning always comes. You know what? We're going to take another opportunity to get the kids up here like really soon, as soon as they can all get together and come up. And uh, that doesn't mean we've got a really long service. Um, I, could, I could go longer if you'd like. I could go probably about another hour, but I don't want to do that. I want to get you guys out here. So if I could have the praise team come forward, and then uh, we'll work on getting the kids out here. And you know what, about halfway through uh, our closing song, uh, the kids are going to start us out. But if you feel compelled, I'd love for you to stand and just worship with them because they're going to come up here on this platform and they're going to worship. They're going to worship Almighty God. The last one on your outline, I know some of you are OCD and you're saying, look, if you don't give me that, I'm going to go crazy. So here it is. Wait on God for the help that you are seeking. Wait on God for the help that you are seeking. Oh, that feels so much better. I've been trying to get rid of that all morning. Uh, you know what? God is, God is waiting on you even now. And if you just answer his call, answer his call, because uh, I know sometimes we have to just wait to get out of the struggles that we're in. But I'll tell you what, the sooner you accept Christ in your life, if you've never done that, uh, the sooner that you can get right back into it and start building a relationship with him and how blessed how, how blessed you will be. Um, you know, some of you are already a follower of Jesus. You're Christian. You have been a personal relationship with God. And um, what you need today is not salvation for your soul, but you need salvation for the dark night uh, that you are in. And Jesus offers that. He offers that. You need salvation from the weary world that's pulling you under and need to be saved, a really difficult situation that you're going through.